So, an adventurer who unmasks a doppelganger but fails to slay them, or an unnoticed witness, may find themselves attacked repeatedly. Hail and well met, and welcome back to another Realms Lore video. I am here with the original creator of the Forgotten Realms, Sir Ed Greenwood himself. And today, we are taking a look behind false faces. Ed, want to expand a little? Sure. The subtitle of this video is Doppelgangers Everywhere. And by that, I really mean everywhere in the realms. They truly are everywhere. So, we're going to talk about them. Don't look behind you. If you're enjoying these Realms Lore videos, please be sure to check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash edgreenwood. And your support by becoming a protector of the realms is what it allows us to continue creating these videos here for you. So, please enjoy this Realms Lore episode on Doppelgangers. In Waterdeep and its environs, everyone has heard of the Unseen. The mysterious, hidden, and in reputation, decidedly sinister organization that supposedly lurks in the shadows, its members hidden in forms not their own, having killed, eaten, and impersonated so many fine upstanding citizens that when you deal with anyone in the deep, you just never know. However, as many merchants will mutter to you if they're convinced you are not yourself a sidler, the most popular current slang term for doppelgangers, Older words include false masks and deadlies, and the race calls themselves Shalar. Doppelgangers live undetected in many cities of Faroon wearing the shapes of others. The individuals they're impersonating are often high-ranking courtiers and civic officials, or innkeepers or tavern masters who reign over large staffs to do the bustling work and most such conspiracy and dark lurker beliefs are fanciful embellishments of some sort of grain of underlying truth. But in this case, the muttering merchants are right. There are indeed doppelgangers dwelling in many large cities, living as easy lives as they can attain without being important enough to command high public profiles and therefore rivals and enemies. Long ago, doppelgangers, like gnomes and halflings, decided that the ambitions, energy, and relentless drive for betterment of the human race made humans ideal folk to live among, and human cities were well suited to them. Unlike gnomes and halflings who thrive in human cities by being tireless workers, both skilled crafters and menders, and swift drudge workers, like the maids, launderers, scullery maids, and chop knives of kitchen and pantry fame, as well as the sorters and packers in many warehouses, Shalar decided to impersonate, and so replace, humans living the lives they craved for themselves. Talk of doppelgangers eating their human victims is usually just that, empty talk. But doppelgangers who don't have ready access to slavers to remove the humans they replace usually do slay their targets and then face the perennial problem of murderers everywhere. Bodies at disposal in a manner that won't link them to the death or ideally lead to the body being found at all. For this reason, there has long been an undercover market among Shalar for buying vials of dragon blood and dragon scales. So the body of someone they've slain can be found clutching a bloody dragon scale, as if slain by a dragon, but able in their last desperate throes to grab at their slayer and so wind up with such trophies. This is unlikely enough to arouse suspicion among veteran watch officers and sensible adventurers or investigating clergy, yet it's better than nothing as a diversion. Most doppelgangers are lazy or rather lack ambition, that is a hunger for power and greater social standing, and they want to impersonate someone who has a life they want to live and are then content to live that life. A few will envy other potential targets and try to jump to a better life, but these are few. 
As success, a life of ease and plenty, depends on doing their job well, local prosperity and therefore peace, shall our become defenders of good status quo, not rock any boats troublemakers and devote themselves to impersonation so good and so unflagging that they'll never be detected. It follows that an adventurer or anyone else trying to bring about local change or usurp or assassinate will find any local doppelgangers working against them. So, doppelgangers who found the life they want never relax. They never let their assumed shapes slip or step out of the personas they've assumed. Most of them escape detection until death, for when they die, their bodies revert to their true doppelganger form. So if they can't get off alone and away from identifying clothing or items, their impersonation will be posthumously revealed. Confidence and superb acting are therefore the keys to a good life for a doppelganger, but most of them remain wary and take care to have escape routes out of the lives they've assumed in case something goes wrong and their true natures get revealed. These often take the form of remaining in contact with fellow doppelgangers, and there are doppelgangers who impersonate successful far-faring merchant traders who visit doppelgangers who will do business with them and at the same time keep in touch with casual and cryptic utterances so as to maintain communication networks where doppelgangers warn each other of impending trouble. Or, failing that, of local criminal networks, guilds, and cabals, not revealing their doppelganger nature, but becoming loyal members for the benefits this can bring. A doppelganger innkeeper will maintain safe house rooms, a tavern master a hidden cellar for stolen or smuggled goods storage. Any doppelganger will act as a message drop or go-between, and so on. This highlights an essential trait of doppelgangers not known to many humans, and so not covered by sages and other lore writers, their innate cooperation with others of their kind. Shalar may have rivalries and even feuds and hatreds with their fellows, but their default is to work with others of their kind, avoid violence, or even getting in the way of the plans of fellows if they know the shape of such schemes. They firmly believe that we prosper together and we dwindle alone. If a non-Shalar discovers the true nature of an individual doppelganger, and that doppelganger realizes it, they may alert other nearby Shalar, and this will have the effect of mobilizing all of these doppelgangers and any associates they may involve, who are usually unaware of the true natures of the Shalar, to attack and eliminate the loose tongue leak who can spread the secret across the community. So, an adventurer who unmasks a doppelganger but fails to slay them, or an unnoticed witness, may find themselves attacked repeatedly. Here are a handful of individual doppelgangers that an adventurer might encounter in the realms of the 1490s DR. Merdalk is an old, wise, worldly Shalar, usually to be found in impersonating Fulcran Dalath, the innkeeper of Volk's Haven, a large new inn in Southbank Scornubel, the former Zerta. Fulcran isn't dead. He is now, with the aid of a Merdalk hired mage's polymorph spells, Merdalk's chief trade contact in Waterdeep, a beautiful woman named Ravera Lindath. Falkrin is thrilled with his new life, and Murdulk is pleased at the caravans full of smuggled goods that enter and leave Waterdeep unhampered by taxation and authorities. Murdulk dedicates himself to keep the reach and clout of rulers from Baldur's Gate to Neverwinter as weak as it now is. Brigandry low, and entrepreneurs from Seacomber to Baragos to Everlund flourishing. He's growing very rich in the process and won't hesitate to spend tens of thousands in gold pieces to hire adventuring bands to take care of nasty little problems for him. Those who entertain ideas of attacking Fulcran Dalath 
keeper of the haven, rapidly discover that he's protected with magical rings and periaps and more, and can wield mighty battle magics that erupt from unlikely looking items. Rohandro Vaunt is based in Marsember in the guise of Anamathea Thea, Sarzek, the helpful lady, but visits Suzail often. The helpful lady provides on the spot wardrobe repairs, meals and drinks, porters to carry heavy purchases or luggage, and guides to wealthy visitors to Marsemble and Suzale. Lost and need luxurious rooms for the night? Lost your sword and need a new one? In urgent need of a bath or a hairdo? The lady is your aid. Most of her clients are Sembians and folk of Westgate wanting to be treated as nobles, but genuine Cormirian and Waterdavian nobles also make use of her services, as she's much cheaper than bringing along dozens of one's own servants. With her on-the-ground local aid and her highly trained staff of bodyguards, litter carriers, and drop everything to paint your portrait or design your stunning new gown, artists and crafters, she can take care of everything if you're reduced to a lone dresser or scribe, or no one at all. Vaunt is privy to the secrets of many wealthy, highborn, and important people along the Dragon Coast, and occasionally makes subtle use of this in business investments and urban real estate purchases, but has no need of anything energetic or particularly illicit to make great wealth steadily. Vaunt already owns more than half a dozen properties in Suzale and even more in Marsember, and some of them are in well-used warehouses. Yansra Yellark is a doppelganger using the name of the human dancer and lady of pleasure who lovingly raised her despite knowing her true nature. Her mother Yansra died in 1466 DR, but the Shalar, who now proudly bears her name, impersonated her for less than a decade before growing tired of dancing on stages and in beds in Baldur's Gate, and retired to the life of a landlord in the Gate and in Athkatla. Her holdings in both cities amount to more than a score of rented out homes and shops, and she dedicates herself to curbing open brigandry and thievery in both cities in favor of protection money and less violent forms of criminal activity such as tax evading smuggling to keep both cities prosperous and visitors to them feeling safer so their trade flows will continue to grow. Yansra loves steering rumors by sponsoring the broadsheet writers she favors who write upbeat news not just reporting on disasters and seeking to shape gossip in society in Baldur's Gate and Athcatla. And because she keeps a low profile and doesn't appear to profit from what she's doing, she's regarded as a harmless booster of local life by those in power and a nice person by many citizens. The powerful might be less pleased with her if they knew how tirelessly she works to curb their power and influence, to ward off tyranny, and make the common folk happy and as wealthy as possible. Elminster approves of her work and has thrice magically helped her to keep her true nature secret. Through him, she has begun to work with Laryl, open lord of Waterdeep, but is wary of increased contact with rulers and the powerful she mistrusts, the Chosen of Mistra. Believing to goddesses, we are all pawns. I shall never be a willing or happy pawn. And there you have it, a glimpse of doppelgangers in the realms today. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak. This time around, we're doing this. A member of the Circle of Eight when he was still alive, Otoluk is dead now. Otoluk was murdered. We remember him from Otoluk's um, Freezing Sphere, Otoluk's Incendiary Cloud, Otoluk's... There are many spells that Otoluk created. He is so synonymous with Greyhawk that his apprentices and disciples 
are even known as Greyhawk Mages. I know, I play one in Lord Gusumba's game. So, Otaluk. And Otaluk was a, a fat, jovial fellow. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, bro. <laughs> You're pretty good yourself. <laughs> okay. Hail and well met, and welcome back to an...